You're watching the Wellness Hour news that makes you healthier. I'm Randy Alvarez. Today's topic, what you need to know if you think or you've been diagnosed with AFib. With us, we have an expert on the topic. He's board certified in cardiology and electrophysiology. He's a rhythm specialist, heart rhythm specialist. With us, we have, and we've had him on the program before, Dr. Navin Sani. Dr. Sani, welcome to the program. Thanks, Randy, pleasure to be here. Good, now I have lots of questions and we were talking in the green room because you were here not so long ago, mm -hmm. but I said, what's changed? And you say, a lot has changed. What's changed? Randy, so much has changed in the field of heart rhythm management. Um, it's a very technical field. There's always medical breakthroughs and changes in the technology, the way we do things, how patients are treated is constantly evolving. Um, there's changes in how we diagnose the arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, how we treat it, various therapeutic interventions that I can share with your audience as we go along. Okay, on. okay. Now, I, I wanna talk about something that last time you were here. Yeah. That what happens is when you have these elevated heart rates, this yeah. AFib, this electrical storm, as you explained to me, in the heart, yeah. right? Yep. That how it's typically handled is with drug therapy like blood thinners that mm -hmm. make people tired and lethargic and beta blockers and they call it drug therapy. And then right. maybe two years, three years, four years, once they have exhausted drug therapy, correct me if I'm wrong on some of these things, yeah. then, they are, then they're sent to an electrophysiologist that possibly is gonna do an ablation technique to stop that communication from one side of the heart to the other. I think that's how it works. Um, and the old days, you had to fail drug therapy first kind of, to even do ablation. But you were saying that if you were in the know, if you were a professional athlete playing for the, the Rams or whatever, uh, or if you had money or friends that were doctors, you would skip drug therapy and go directly to this treatment of, of uh, ablation for AFib treatment. And you told me over there that now it's like a first line therapy. Right. So elaborate on that. Yeah, so you know what's changed, Randy, is when I first started doing AFib ablation was 12, 13 years ago, and it was relatively new then. Um, and like any therapy, it evolves and it improves over time. And as AFib ablation has improved, it's gotten faster, it's gotten safer, it's gotten more effective, it's really become a first-line therapy. And that's based on uh, medical studies where they've taken patients and they've said, well, let me give you the best medications we have available, or let me offer you an ablation therapy. It's a first-line therapy, the first thing we do. And the outcomes are substantially better when you do ablation first. Is that right? That's right. So statistically, they're just better outcomes. Correct. Okay. And the reason is AFib is a progressive disease. The longer you have it, the worse it gets over time. Your heart remodels, it gets scar tissue, it enlarges. And if you can get in early and prevent that progression, you can reduce the risk of things like strokes, of congestive heart failure. And so what the studies have shown, Randy, is you can reduce, again, strokes, heart failure, hospitalization, and even death in certain patients of populations by treating the disease aggressively and early, i.e. with an ablation as opposed to failing medications okay. first. Okay, if it's as good as you say it is, yep. eliminating the drug therapy, yep. why is anybody doing it? Is it just because they hear surgery and they say, no thanks? Yeah, I mean, I mean is that's, that it? Is that's, that... that's part of it. I think definitely people are concerned about the risk of surgery, and there's always risk to any type of surgery, including ablation. In my view, the risks are low. Uh, as I've mentioned to you, most patients these days, I'm actually sending home the same day. They come in, they get a minimally invasive procedure, and they go home the same day. But people are. Are they a little sore the next day? Yeah, I mean, it, it's done under anesthesia, so you don't feel anything during the procedure. But when you go home, you can be a little uncomfortable. You can have a little bit of soreness in your leg, which is how we get up to the heart. Okay. You can have a little tightness in your heart from the ablation, which causes a little inflammation. But it's a couple of days. So within two days, you're, you could go back to the gym or you say, hey, take it easy. Like you don't want to raise your heart rate at the beginning or, or no? Well, so I tell most of my patients to go back to work in about two days. Um, in terms of really heavy activity, like going to the gym, lifting weights, I tell them about a week. One week, and One they week. could go back to max heart rate if that's what they want to do. Yes. yes. So let's start with what is AFib? Yeah. What is it? What <laughs> defines it? Exactly. So AFib is a really common heart rhythm abnormality. So if you think about it, your heart is a mechanical pump whose job is to pump blood out to all of your vital organs, right? And the way it coordinates the blood flow is based on a series of electrical signals. 
So normally there's an area in your heart called the sinus node, the pacemaker of your heart, that sort of tells the heart how fast to beat. So when you're sitting here talking to me, your heart's 60 beats a minute. When you're running at the gym, it's 140 or 150, and that's regulated by your sinus node. AFib is an arrhythmia where you have cells that start to misfire. And so instead of the heart blood flow being coordinated, they're chaotic. They're coming from all over the place. And so the heart's beating fast and erratically. And this is an electrical problem within the heart. Correct. There okay. are cells in the heart that electrically are telling the heart to beat at the wrong times. So they're beating too fast, too slow, with no natural rhythm. That's very chaotic. And the consequence of that is that your heart doesn't beat as efficiently. So the amount of blood your heart pumps out with every beat is erratic. It goes down. And because the blood flow goes down, people feel tired, they feel out of breath, they don't think as clearly because the blood's not circulating as well. Okay. And then if you don't control it, if it starts racing uncontrollably, it wears the heart out, it leads to congestive heart failure. And also when the blood's not flowing well, you can form blood clots and those can lead so to So untreated, strokes. it could turn into a stroke situation. Correct, correct. So it's very important to diagnose it find what the problem is, and then treat it before a bad outcome happens. Okay, now, so what's the whole idea with drug therapy, what it's supposed to do, yeah. and what's the big difference with your, uh, the therapy you're doing, ablation therapy? Drug therapy is very good for a lot of patients. It often can control the symptoms, help the heart stay in rhythm but it doesn't always work. But so, the blood thinners, why does that work so well? Why does the blood thinners, the blood work, thinners so well? work so well with this? Yeah, blood thinners are very effective. So backing up one step, but when you think about AFib therapy, there's sort of various things you need to consider. So one thing you need to consider is how do you control how fast or slow the heart's going? So that's one aspect of therapy. Okay. Another aspect of therapy is if the blood's not moving efficiently when it's an AFib, how do you get it back into normal rhythm? That's where ablation and certain antirhythmic medications can come into play. And then the third aspect of therapy is how do you prevent stroke? And so they're all important with AFib and can be managed a little bit differently. So specifically with regards to the blood thinners, when your heart isn't pumping the blood very efficiently, it just is not moving, it stagnates, and it can be prone to clot. And if you can keep your blood thin with a blood thinner, then that can help prevent a blood clot from forming in the heart, and that can okay. reduce stroke. And they're highly effective, but there's downsides to blood thinners, right? But it's not going to the underlying cause. It's not treating the underlying cause, It's no. just a kind of a remedy for the particular problem, you know, for the, for the bad outcomes that can happen if it's not It's like a safety approach almost. By having thinner blood, you're less likely when you have this AFib episode to, to clot. Correct. Okay. Correct. But very important outcomes because strokes are probably the most devastating consequence of having AFib. It really is the worst outcome. And so trying to prevent that with either blood thinners or alternative therapies, like something I do called a Watchman procedure, that's a really important aspect of therapy preventing people from getting hospitalized and going into heart failure is really important. And then quality of life. Um, people feel better when they're in normal rhythm, and that's a huge benefit of catheter ablation, especially over medications, as you asked, because a lot of people get side effects from medications. They don't feel well physically or mentally being on them forever. And so if you can reduce or eliminate those, that so can be... So blood thinners make you tired or make you feel weak? Well... Most of the medications that are used to treat the AFib, like you mentioned beta blockers, okay. certain antiarrhythmic medications like flecainide or sodalol or amiodarone, there's a lot of choices out there, but a lot of them have very significant side effects. So a beta blocker, what's the side effects there? Exactly. The most common side effects of beta blockers are what you said, being tired, being fatigued, very common side effect of beta blockers, because what those medications do, Rain, is they slow your heart down, they slow your system down. So it's not surprising that they would make you feel tired or fatigued. And so if you can cut back or eliminate medical therapy, for example, with an ablation, a lot of people have improvement from getting off the medications. But again, also in terms of just getting their heart rhythm strained out, controlled has a lot of benefit. By the way, do these, I don't know what they're called, AFib episodes or events, do they happen late at night? Do they happen in the middle of the day? Do they happen usually in the morning? or you just n never yeah. know, or in stressful situations? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. So atrial fibrillation is when some parts of the heart start misfiring and overtaking your normal pacemaker, your sinus node, like we talked about. 
when those cells choose to misfire can be completely random. So okay. they can occur at any time for really no rhyme or reason for a lot of people, particularly in the beginning of the disease, because when it first starts, it can be very sporadic and intermittent. And that's actually one of the challenges because you can come in to see your doctor and be having these symptoms say, you know, my heart races sometimes and I get dizzy. And then they can look at you and do an EKG and listen to you and go, no, everything's fine. And it might be at that time, but then two days later, you might go back into it. And so having a way to diagnose it is very important. And so the way we diagnose AFib is usually with an EKG, an electrocardiogram, which you can see the abnormal heart rhythm. But the problem is if you do that EKG when you're not in it, it's gonna show normal. So often we need to monitor, period, pe monitor, period, monitor people for an extended period of time so we actually pick up the heart rhythm when they're having the so symptoms. So they go home with some sort of a device that measures Exactly, heart rate. exactly. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, one thing I use very commonly is something called a patch monitor. There's various companies that make them, Zio, Bardi, Cam, and it's basically just a little patch. In fact, I have one here. Okay. And we just put it on your chest and you can do your activity. You can shower, you can go to the gym, you can go to work, and it records your heart continuously for several weeks. And so if you're going in and out of it in your sleep or just when you're at the gym working out, it'll pick that up and we can make a diagnosis and then help treat the things that are gonna happen down the road. For people who have it even more intermittently that we wouldn't pick it up on the patch, sometimes we put in little small heart devices called a loop recorder. And That's we just, small. This small. And we just put it under the skin and that can last in there for up to four years to pick up a really intermittent heart racing Is problem. it connected like a computer Wi-Fi kind of a yeah, thing so you can yeah. see what's going on? Exactly. It Bluetooths to a little device that then transmits over the internet to our office. And then, you know, in today's world, Randy, um, people pick it up themselves. People are wearing Apple watches. There's things you can buy called a Cardia mobile app where you can take your own EKG at home on your smartphone. So there's a lot of ways to pick it up and you want to pick it up at the time people are having the symptoms because it can come and go. What happens over time though is what initially starts as an intermittent episode where the heart starts being chaotically and then it stops and resets on its own is it gets to the point where that stops happening. It becomes what we call persistence where you go into it and then you just stay in that arrhythmia. For how long? Forever. Like, but I mean, so people, their heart rates go up how high? Like how many beats per minute? Oh gosh, so yeah, a normal heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. That's sort of how we define a normal heart rate. Okay. In AFib, I've seen people go, go up over 200 beats a minute, like fast to the point that they'll pass out. Um, but I'd say most commonly, uh, you'll see heart rates about 120 to 160. Just out of the blue happens. For no reason. It's like you, if you were in AFib right now, um, your heart rate could be 130 as opposed to you know probably 60 right now, which yeah. it probably yeah. is. Yep. You know, my Apple Watch will tell me sometimes that my it, 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 my heart rate goes up to 110. Mm -hmm. It's only happened a couple of times. Yeah. But, you know, and that's what's nice about these Apple Watches. Okay, so let's yeah. say you have AFib. Yep. You get on the drug therapy. Yeah. Okay. That's one option, because that's just an option. And a regular cardiologist has different training, different thinking than an electrophysiologist. Correct. Because you're the ones that are doing the ablation therapy. Correct. So... One of the things, one of the challenges that you told me happened last time is when you, because you're afraid of surgery possibly, like a lot of people, I just don't want surgery. I'm yeah. gonna do drug therapy, beta blockers, whatever, for stroke prevention, things like that. But what happens is, because you still have these episodes, yeah. that your heart remodels as you call it. Right. It changes shape, one side gets bigger than the other. And so then it gets so bad the cardiologist says you failed drug therapy, now you need ablation. Yeah. So by the time they get to you, they're already in bad shape. Yeah, and that's... And sometimes they can't even be helped very well. Yeah. Is that true? That's true. That's one of the challenges because AFib is progressive. And so every time you have an episode and your heart starts beating erratically, it starts to adapt to that and you get scar tissue and it, enlarge, oh. it enlarges. And that's actually why initially the episodes, as I mentioned, the shortest sporadic, and then they start coming on more often and then they start lasting longer, and then they become persistent. So it always starts small and just gets bigger and bigger and yeah. bigger and bigger. So yeah. if it was somebody in your own family, would you say, hey, get ablation first? I get it early, absolutely. You would get it right away? Absolutely. Can they like say, I don't ever want beta blockers, blood thinners, whatever, I just want ablation. Yeah. So, so that now is covered by insurance and correct. nobody's gonna argue with you on that? Exactly, it's now actually a class one indication, which in a medical guideline point of view means the recommended therapy 
as a first-line therapy for people who have AFib and who are symptomatic and they want it fixed. There was a time where it wasn't, where you had to try and fail medical therapy first. But again, as the procedure has advanced, as it's become faster, safer, and more effective, it's a very appropriate first-line option. I think you told me like in six or seven years, you really ha yeah. haven't had a big problem in, in the surgical procedures with AFib. Correct. I mean, with the ablation, I yeah. should say. So let's tell me, what is ablation, and how does it stop this electrical storm? Yeah, great question. So what happens is you get these cells that start misfiring and beating chaotically, right? And so what the medications try to do most of the antirhythmic medications, they're challenging to use. They honestly have risks. They can cause arrhythmias. They can cause side effects. But what they do is they alter ion channels to try to prevent your cells from misfiring. And they're also not that effective. They probably work 50% of the time. So what ablation does is, well, if we can't suppress the cell from misfiring, let's just get rid of it. It's not doing the right thing. And so what we do is we put a small IV into the vein in your leg, usually in the groin, from the groin, the vein threads up and connects to the heart. When we get in there, we have catheters that have metal tips, and those metal tips look at electrical current. And so you can see where those cells are misfiring, and then we need to get rid of them. And there, we use energy, and there's various sources. So the a heat source. That's one of them. So there's a lot of sources. The most common one is radio frequency energy, so heat, alternating electrical current that essentially burns the cell until it's dead. Um, there's other sources like cryoenergy, so you freeze the heart tissue until it stops misfiring. And there's a lot of new technologies in development. A really exciting one is called pulse field ablation. It's actually approved in Europe today. It's not in the U.S. yet, but it will be here in a few years. And it's another way to very safely uh, get rid of these abnormal so, cells. So you're creating like scar tissue that stops the communication that allows the heart to be raised to 200 beats a minute. Essentially, yeah. We're kind basically of. getting rid of the abnormal cells so they can't get out and make the rest of the heart race. Correct. Okay, so it's abnormal cells you're 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 killing those cells? Essentially, yeah. Because for some reason when you were here last time, I yeah. thought that there was like, you know, two sides of the heart and basically you're stopping the communication from the right side and the left side, but that's not I had that wrong. Yeah. Yeah, we're not really stopping the communication between the right and the left, but we're per your normal pacemaker in your heart, your sinus node is on the right side that connects, that not, not connects, but that sort of regulates the heartbeat. And then with AFib, usually those abnormal cells most commonly are on the other side, on the left side, and they're taking off and taking over what your normal pacemaker should be. So when we go to the left side of the heart, we destroy those cells from misfiring and taking over the right side from doing its job. Okay, and then yeah. the AFib stops. Yeah, most so, of the time. So, so now you're doing this like almost every day. I mean, there's yeah. up to like 90% success rate, depending on which study you, you look at. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, so it depends a little bit on the patient population. So when you get this really burnt out heart, so somebody who has had AFib for years and they've been, we do what we call a cardioversion, you try to shock the heart back into rhythm and try a bunch of medications and it progresses. And then when I see them, and their heart is enlarged and the function's down and they've been in AFib for three years and there's a scar tissue everywhere, you have success rates about 60%. On the other hand, if I get a young, you know, 40 year old who's had just, you know, intermittent episodes like here and there a few times a year, and I can go and eliminate those cells before they've developed all this remodeling in the heart, you can get success rates about 90%. Yeah. So somebody that, def okay, so the, the key to this thing is They've got to get the diagnosis. Do you really yeah. have AFib or are you just having panic attacks, right? Right, exactly. So once you figure out, okay, you have AFib, yeah. their option is go to ablation first. Yes, yes. If that's their choice, which I give everybody that choice because it's a recommended therapy. If they're scared of it, if they don't want to do it, certainly you can always try medications. There's nothing wrong with that option. Okay. I but, tried to put you on the spot over there and I yeah. said... Uh, I said, so it, it, is the, the politics of it, are you getting them too late still? That means, are they still, and you said yes. Yeah. That means they're still staying too long on the drug therapy yeah. when it should be faster to ablation. Correct, absolutely, 100% wow. correct. Yeah. And that's the message today, I guess. Yeah. Is get a, so, so you brought some, uh, you say a lot has changed. You didn't yeah. even have these, Yeah. Uh, what, a couple of years ago, three years ago? Yeah. So, so tell me what these are, Yeah. these so, devices. Yeah, so a lot of really important advances in technology. So, for example, with atrial fibrillation, what usually happens is when the heart starts beating chaotically and erratically, the heart rate usually changes. And so most of the time it'll go way too fast, as we talked about. 
but the opposite can happen. Sometimes it can get way too slow, and in fact, it can even forget to beat, and it cannot beat for several seconds, and that, that can make people pass out. Or the other thing that can happen is if the heart starts racing, and then you need to give medications like beta blockers to slow it down, it can get too slow on the medication too. And then when it gets too slow, the medications can't help you. And so that's when a pacemaker comes into play. A pacemaker is a device that can speed up the heart rate. It can't slow it down, but it can speed it up when it gets too slow. And so one of the things I brought is a newer pacemaker. Uh, this is a micro leadless yeah, pacemaker. Yeah, hold that up. I mean, it's very, very small. Yeah. So, so, so where does that go? So this is a pacemaker, this whole thing, and it goes in the heart. And unlike a normal pacemaker, which I don't know if you've ever seen a pacemaker, but a normal a pacemaker is put up under the skin. People sort of have a bulge in their chest with this pacemaker. This one we actually implant from the leg, just like we do in ablation, put it right into the heart, these little hooks sort of hook it into place. And that can prevent the heart from going too slow. Too slow. And it's a really cool little device for people who have AFib and they're not, you know, have this device in their chest and constantly reminded they have a problem. And it does a, a great job. Is that inevitable too? Because I only think of AFib as going high. Is that something that happens to all AFib people as it progresses? You, you run into that slow heart rate it's very problem? It's very common. Not like everybody. Like 50% of 40%? Yeah, I mean, it's a high percentage. I don't know if it's 30% or what have you, but it, it's a common problem. It tends to happen more too as you get older, but not everybody. I have, you know, some patients, honestly, who are really young and they've just had the AFib for so many years that it just starts to go uh, too fast and too slow, both in the same so, patient. So for peace of mind, that's a nice little device to have. And how long does it last? Yeah. And what's the downtime? Yeah, it's um, you know, it's a procedure that takes 30 minutes um, and the battery lasts usually 12 years. Um, after 12 which years? Time. Yeah, after which time. Is it also connected to any type of uh, communication with the doctor? Yeah, exactly. So it, um, same thing like the, um, the loop recorder we talked about it's the same technology it bluetooths to uh, a little transmitter that you keep in your house on your usually on your nightstand or anywhere you want to keep it and then that transmits over the internet you'll know if the battery's going low or things like that yeah or if there's an arrhythmia so if somebody has an issue like their heart shoots up to 200 we get an alert we get notified about it our nurse practitioner calls you or brings you into the office adjust your medications okay the other huge advance randy and this is something i'm also really excited about is, is this thing this is called a, a watchman device and a watchman device is a, a device it's like a little crown <laughs> yeah, it's a little crown we we can put this device in the heart to prevent stroke and so as we were talking earlier what are the problems with the blood thinners it's not so much about feeling tired on the blood thinners but it's bleeding so blood thinners are so really, dangerous for that it's dangerous so they're really really important um blood thinners are really really important to prevent stroke and so in the old days the most common blood thinner was something called Coumadin or Warfarin. And, you know, patients lovingly refer to that as rat poison, right? They hate it. Nobody likes Coumadin. A few years ago, probably actually more like six, seven years ago, um, we came up with better blood thinners. They're called the direct acting anticoagulants. Um, they're called Rivaroxaban or Apixaban. You've probably seen the commercials on TV for Xeralto or Eliquis. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're really effective at preventing stroke. But the problem with any blood thinner, whether it's Coumadin or these newer ones, is that people can have bleeding events. And so when you're in that situation where you take something that can help prevent stroke, but it's causing you another problem that can be just as bad, like bleeding, getting blood transfusions, et cetera, we have this alternative therapy called a watchman. And so one time you were asking me, like, what are some of your, what are some of your regrets, right? What are things that you see that like I, the that I see? Like you, I asked you. Yeah. What frustrates you with what, what you're doing? So, I saw a patient today, uh, just today in the office before we came over to the studio. And uh, this is a gentleman who has AFib. He has several risk factors for stroke. We look at what are risk factors for stroke as you get older, if you have diabetes, high blood pressure, there's things that make your stroke risk higher. And so this gentleman has a lot of risk factors for stroke and he has AFib, so he needs to be on a blood thinner. And he was on one. Okay. And then what happened though is that uh, he started having some blood in his urine. He has prostate issues. A lot of men, as they get older, have prostate issues. And then he started having blood in his urine, and so the, his doctor said, oh, well, you're bleeding. We have to stop your blood thinner. And so they did, and then that was that. That's all that happened. And so then he has AFib. He has risk factors for stroke. He's not on a blood thinner anymore. But then he has a massive stroke, um, a massive stroke. So Wow, what he, happens? Well, now he's hemiparetic. He's paralyzed on half his body because oh, wow. the blood clot that formed in his heart went to the brain, occluded the blood supply, damaged the brain, and now he can't move half of his body. 
And what should have happened, in my mind, is when he started having bleeding trouble, he should have been referred for a Watchman device because we could have put this in his heart, he could have been off the blood thinner safely, and then that stroke never would have occurred. And did he ever have uh, the uh, uh, did he ever have the ablation procedure? No, he was never offered that so either. So he was never even offered it until now. So. He actually saw me today, okay. uh, and we're actually going to do the ablation now. Although, again, he had the diagnosis four or five years ago, and he's another one, as so I mentioned. So the heart changed, so it'll be yeah. a little trickier to It'll to, be trickier, and he has heart failure now, and he's had a stroke now, and he's been on this medication called amiodarone, which is it's the most effective medication we have, but it also has the most side effects. And so all these factors, again, it's what I was saying earlier, like if I could have seen this guy four years ago, I could have prevented a stroke. I could have probably prevented his heart failure from progressing. And it's sort of that delayed time to therapy. That's probably my biggest frustration. And, you know, and this to me yeah. is a big news story. I got to tell you something. Yeah. Because to think that, first of all, how many people have AFib? Are there any estimates out there? Yeah, a lot. So AFib affects 1% of the entire population of the US. So today that's around 6 million people. And that number is actually projected to grow exponentially because our population's aging and all the comorbidities that sort of go along with having arrhythmia, high blood pressure, obesity, as you know, is huge, sleep apnea, all increase the risk of developing AFib as you get older. Okay, so six million people approximately have yeah. AFib. I'm sure yeah. there's another couple or a million that are not, not even detected or yeah. not, never going to the doctor about it. Yeah. But to you, in your mind, yeah. you're going, these are, all these people should be getting, if they're diagnosed and if in fact they have AFib, they yeah. should be getting this uh, ablation. Yeah, it's is an, that how you feel? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but yeah. is that how you feel? Um, like most of them? Close, like, close. I mean, I, I don't know that it's the right therapy for everybody, and everybody I think deserves options, but my point is, is they have to see the right person to review their whole history, understand what their issues are, and give them the best recommendation. Electrophysiologist. Right? An electrophysiologist. So that's the name of the cardiologist that does this. Because yeah. I've talked to a couple of people. My yeah. neighbor across the street has AFib, and he said, yeah. or had it, he has a pacemaker yeah. of some sort. Yeah. But but I, I, he's never heard of an electrophysiologist. Yeah. In fact, nobody's ever heard of an <laughs> electrophysiologist. Well, see, that's sort of the problem, right? Because a lot of times, like your, for your family doctor, they go, oh, I, I can put you on Coumadin, and I can you know, put you on a beta blocker, and I can manage your AFib, right? And so That's how do, it normally goes down? That's how it can Primary go down. Primary care, just kind of trying to see if that works. Yeah. Or even your cardiologist, you know, a lot of cardiologists say, oh, well, I can give you these medications because that's what they know how to do, right? And so they, they can give you these medications and they can, you know, try to prevent their heart racing. They can try to prevent you from having a stroke. But then again, the patient I saw today, he has a cardiologist who put him on the blood thinner. That was great. But then when he stopped it, he never offered him another option. This. And so that's the problem. If you, people don't know about the option, if they're not educated about it and they're not offered it, I think that's the issue. People can make their own decisions. You yeah. can take medications. You can live with AFib. I'm not saying everybody needs an ablation, but I think everybody should have the option, option. to know that that's an, that they can have one if they think it'd be better for but them. But if you have legitimate, a legitimate yeah. AFib, yeah, then ablation in most cases is a great option. I think is that's that true. A, yeah, I think it's a great option for. Could a, a cardiologist lot of that's not an electrophysiologist sit here and say, "I don't buy that." They, I, they can for various reasons, and, and the main one, and this is a very important point, is AFib ablation is a very good procedure. It improves quality of life. As I mentioned, it makes people, gives them more energy, it makes them less out of breath, it reduces, probably reduces stroke, well, not probably, there's medical data that shows that it reduces stroke risk, heart failure, hospitalizations, but a caveat to AFib ablation is it doesn't always work. So as we talked about, in a bad heart, success rates might be 60%. In a good heart, it might be 90%. But even if it doesn't always work the first time, and that can happen, um, people can start to get AFib again, and then you can do it again if you, you do need a touch to. up. You can do a touch up, and, so, and they're really home that that same day. They could go home if everything's yeah, all right. Yeah. And they're back in the gym in three days. Right. Because but part of it is look. I remember I had heartburn many, many years yeah. ago, and I thought yeah. I had a heart problem. Right? Yeah. It, it's been gone ever since. Yeah. But the bottom line is I was afraid to go to the gym. I was afraid. Carlsbad 5000, they have yeah. every single year, their large 5K. Yeah. So I could imagine these people with AFib, yeah. they have to really, they're worried at all times about their activity, yeah. 
about yeah. everything. Yeah, a lot of people right? are like they. Uh, you know, I talked to somebody today, also another patient who we're doing an ablation on soon, but she's the same what you just said like she does physical therapy because she has a bad hip and she's like i can't do it because every time i try to work with my therapist my heart starts racing and i i can't do that i can't exercise i can't do therapy that's a really common problem and so if you can calm that down to allow people to be more physically active and get their life back it's very helpful and so um, i see a huge amount of benefit to it um, because it doesn't work every time that's probably why some cardiologists say oh i'm not going to refer you for that but I think you have to give people the choice. I think you have to give them the option because the majority of people get significant improvement. Is that right? So, the uh, you know, if, if this interview today, because yeah. look, doctors are, you know, I think that they're well-intentioned cardiologists yeah. and sometimes the patients don't wanna to listen to them. They hear surgery, no, no, let's try that. The patient almost dictates the treatment sometimes, Yeah. right? And what happens is you only have 10 minutes, five minutes with, with a patient and it requires a little bit of talking them into something that's good for them. Yeah, right? Yeah. Well, so I actually book all of my consults for an hour, um, particularly for that reason, because I think it's a really important okay. discussion and it, and it takes a lot of time. And so every new patient I see, uh, particularly for an ablation consult, it's always an hour. And we sort of talk through all the therapies. What are the risks? What are the benefits? Why should I do it? What are my alternatives? I think you have to have that education. And a lot of people come in educated. They get on the internet, they read all sorts of yeah. stuff. They come in with a lot of ideas. Sometimes their ideas are right, sometimes they're wrong. Um, but I'll answer that too and explain what, what they know, what's correct about it, what's not, and then educate them. What's the biggest, because look, I call it yeah. Dr. Google, right? Yeah. Everybody that comes in, they already, they already know yeah. more than you do, right? Yeah. But what's the biggest misinformation or the biggest misconception about AFib that's out there that you could lay to rest right now that you hear all the time? Well, a lot of people think it'll be fixed by a pacemaker. Uh, that is, seems to be very common that they, oh, I have AFib, can I just get a pacemaker? And the answer is no. Uh, what a pacemaker does is if your heart slows down, it speeds it up. It's only That's for it. low. It's only for low. So if you go I into AFib and, yeah, if you go into AFib and your heart's racing, the pacemaker does absolutely nothing. <laughs> so a lot of people think a pacemaker will fix their problem and it won't. And the other thing is they probably think beta blockers are going to fix the problem. It's going to go away. But yeah. you say it's progressive. Yeah, it gets worse. And so the beta blockers can help the racing and, and they are appropriate therapy for a lot of patients, but um, they're certainly not gonna fix you from having the arrhythmia and prevent it from getting worse. Do you have to be fully grown, like 23 years old to get this done? Because a lot of kids are getting this. Uh, well, so there's, different, so there's different types of heart rhythm problems. And so um, uh, there are things like Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome that's actually very common in kids. And those are things that we do ablations for even in very young children. Okay. AFib tends to be more common as you get older. So I've had 20 year olds and such with AFib and done ablations on them, but I'd say it gets more and more prevalent as you get older. So when I said it affects 1% of the entire population, that's babies to adults, right? But when you get into like your 70 and 80 year olds, it's not 1%, it's actually 10%. So it, the prevalence is a lot higher as you get older. So most of my patients who are, have AFib and are getting ablations are probably be, probably between 40 and 80. Um, so an 80 year old, they could have their whole life, no problem, and all of a sudden it comes on at 80. Yeah. Yeah. They go first line therapy as far as uh, ablation. Yeah. yeah. Is their recovery pretty pretty good? Yeah, yeah, I've done, Downtime's you know, the same, three, four days yeah, later, they're yeah, fine. Yeah, exactly, you know, so I've, I do ablations in a lot of people in their 80s, late 80s, even, I think probably the oldest has been 90, but yeah. Wow, so, so people even with a remodeled heart, somebody yeah. watching this, they're going, well, I've had a for, for five years, I've been on drug therapy, yeah. he talked about remodeling, gives you, but still, if 60, 40 to 60%, yeah. it takes care of the problem, it's worth the try, it sounds like to me. Yeah, for a lot of people it is, you know, depending on the situation. So, you know, if people are doing fine living with it, that, that's always an option. I always give people that choice because, because I think you have to make your own personal choice. But if your quality of life is going to be better and, you know, if it's worth a 60, 70 percent chance, even in a heart where it's not the highest success, um, you're going to give it that shot. I actually, honestly, yesterday did a procedure on a patient who, um, when he, again, sort of the same story, I hate this story, but um, has AFib, it's refractory to amiodarone, the strongest medication we have, and he has heart failure, and when he goes into it, I mean, he just completely decompensates. He gets hospitalized, he can't breathe, he can't sleep at night because he can't breathe, and so I told him, look, we're looking at a 60, 70 percent shot because this is where your heart is today, yeah. but it's absolutely worth that shot because there's a, a good enough chance it's going to improve his quality of life, 
And if it doesn't take, we might have to so do it again. So it makes again. it always a little bit better? Yes, yes. So, so, so there's always improvement. There's, just, there's just usually improvement. And sometimes it might take more than one procedure to get there, which is why a cardiologist doesn't always refer. Because like, oh, well, it didn't work. Well, but like you said, it, it, it's improved. And you can actually take it a step further if you have to go in and sort of modify a little bit more. Um, so there are certain refractory cases where maybe the ablation is, isn't going to get a lot of improvement, but for a lot of people, it's going to get a lot of improvement. So if you catch them early, if you catch them early, like if they do, educate yeah. themselves, watch this show. Yeah. And, and by the way, is AFib, was it going on for 10 years before it actually got to the point where it was 200 beats a minute? I mean, did, did it start at like 110 or 120 or does it happen fast? It usually happens fast. Okay. Like usually when it kicks in, um, even for the first time, totally out of the blue I got it. Okay. and can just start taking off for no reason so at all. So if you get that person in your office, yeah. ideal candidate. Yeah, for sure. Are, are there any, I asked you this in the green room and I didn't let you finish Yeah. because we were in a time crunch, but okay, so you do ablation. Yeah. Okay. You, you killed those important cells that are in and around this, your body's own pacemaker. Yeah. Are there any, I mean, didn't you need that? Didn't God made it that way where you had to have that? I mean, yeah. are there any long-term side effects with ablation? Yeah, no. So yeah, those cells are abnormal. Um, they're misfiring, they shouldn't be there. And you're just taking away what shouldn't have been there to begin with. Okay. They're abnormal cells. So, you know, there's always a surgical risk. Um, there are real uh, risks for complications and I always go over those in very detail during my hour long consult, but they're extremely low. I mean, like I said, I've done this procedure in people who are in their 80s and coming and gone home the same day. Um, not to say that- they Did they ever get frustrated, confide you and say, how come nobody ever told me about this? I feel great. Yeah, that happens a lot. It actually does. Um, and that and that's my point is, is I just want the education to be out there. I want people to be informed. I want them to make the decision that's best for them. Okay. And a, ablation may not be the best decision for them. I'm not at, here to say it's the right answer for everybody. But it everybody. sounds like it is, by the way. It is for a lot of people. Okay. And, and, and they have to at least know about it and have the option. And if they want to do it, cool. And if they don't, that's okay. But this thinking of, I got to do drug therapy first. Yeah. Then I'll do that's as a go last away. resort. That's got to go that's away. That's got to go away. And that's their problem because that is the older thinking. And so particularly in the older doctors, that sort of is their thinking from okay. 20 years ago. And they haven't like, updated Like, let's not put it. our patients through <laughs> surgery. Yeah. They haven't updated their thinking based on the progress that's been made with the procedure. And that's, that's sort of the problem. Right, okay. because when they were in medical school, when they had their education, things evolve. Right, they they evolve, and technologies change, and uh, you know outcomes are better, complications are lower, the procedure is faster. I mean, when I was here last time, I had never sent a patient home the same day ever, and I do that every case all now. the time. And so those sort it's of it's become more routine for you. It's more routine. It's faster. Is the imaging better? Is that why too? Yeah, the technology is better. And the instruments and things like that. Exactly. And the outcomes are better, and the success rates are higher. And it's going to continue to improve. Just like I mentioned, this therapy that may be coming down the road, pulse field ablation, um, that has a lot of potential ways to to be game changers in terms of being faster and safer, even than we are today. And we're already much better now than we were ten years ago when I started. And that's sort of the point. People who aren't knowledgeable because they're not in the field and even if it's the cardiologist like they may not know the advances that are happening okay. and what the options are that are available and what and you know what's best for that patient and so that's why i think everybody just has to be educated okay. so that they can make the right decision for them and and that's sort of my biggest sort of yeah now you work with palomar medical center yeah which is well known here in san diego yep. uh everything we're talking about is covered by insurance yep like Medicare, mm -hmm. is that right? Correct. And PPO and HMO and, and, and those kind of things. Yep. And what is your title over there? What do you do? Well, I'm the director of electrophysiology, the director of heart rhythm problems at Palomar Hospital. So I actually started that program, Randy, from scratch. Like they, Palomar Hospital didn't have a heart rhythm program and I sort of got recruited there to build one. And so I started- You were at SDSU scratch. or something when I, when I met you the first time, yeah, right? Yeah, UCSD. UCSD. Yeah, so. UCSD. And so Palomar, uh, realized that this was an important therapy. Uh, they didn't have anybody in North County who could provide that therapy. I went up there and started that program from scratch. We've built it up, it's done great. Um, and I think it, it you know, offers a lot of care to people who didn't have that option before. And, but it's still about getting that education out so they get referred for the therapy. Because like I said, uh, up in that area, like they didn't even have a doctor who provided those services at all. So you can see why they weren't getting referred for the therapy. And even though we're there and you know we're trying to get the education out, they still get referred too late. Often. So would you say, I mean, it's fair to say tens of thousands yeah. of people in San Diego County are yeah. on drug therapy 
and they may not even know their option of what we're talking about today. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a con I think that's true and a concern. And you know, fortunately today, with like you said, Dr. Google, I mean, people can educate themselves, but if they don't get that feedback from somebody who has the experience, they don't always understand what they read on the internet. And so I, I actually like when people come and educate it and read and ask questions, and then I just want to make sure that they're understanding what they've read correctly. Um, because you know that that can be a barrier too, and then if you don't get it from your your regular doctor, if they don't know, then that's a problem. And sometimes, sorry, yeah. sorry, but sometimes people will request, and they should, like they will see their cardiologist and say, well, but can I see an electrophysiologist? Like they'll ask, and they absolutely should. Ask for an electrophysiologist. Yeah. makes sense. Yeah. The uh, you, you know, look, I'm I'm. I, I, I try to think I know a lot about medical stuff, right? I'm probably more confused yeah. than ever. 22 <laughs> years interviewing medical doctors, things like that. And yeah. I try to tell sometimes people on the outside, yeah. you know, have you ever talked about ablation? Have you seen electrophysiology? And they look at me like, look, if that was good for me, my cardiologist would have told me. Yeah. People put so much faith in their doctors. Yeah. but and, and I know that there's, you know, I believe the doctors um, are well-meaning and want to do the best for their patients. Yeah. But what you really explained and even brought it up today that, the two specialties have different information, different training, different philosophies and approaches to yeah. fixing the same problem. Yeah. So an electrophysiologist, Randy, is a board certified cardiologist. So I did cardiology yeah. training, but then spent another two years specializing in arrhythmia management. And so your regular cardiologist didn't spend those extra years and they don't necessarily have that same knowledge base. And so it's not that like you said, I think they're well-intentioned, Yeah, yeah. but they just might not know, and that, that's the problem. Okay, good. So ask to see an electrophysiologist. Yeah. Well, Dr. Sani, always a pleasure. Thank you for uh, taking time from your super busy schedule to come down here to the studio. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank good you. Stuff. Appreciate Thank being you. here. Thanks so much. You've been watching The Wellness Hour News That Makes You Healthier. I'm Randy Alvarez. For now, I wish you good health. Thanks for watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news with your host, Randy Alvarez, the authority on health issues.